Well, good morning. I want to begin with a look at biblical stewardship principles. It is not rocket science to understand biblical stewardship. Uh, a basic understanding of, of scripture uh, is more than sufficient. Uh, a theological education um, uh, sometimes uh, causes more, more difficulty because the basic message is really very straightforward. However, in my experience, often we adopt a biblical message and then a worldly method. Uh, more often taken from university fundraising campaigns than it is from scripture. And the way we go about uh, the practicalities of handling finances and stewardship in the church often undermines that simple and straightforward uh, biblical message. Now, before I uh, say anything further, I want to be clear. I understand that stewardship is more than money. Stewardship is, as we often say, time, talent, and treasure. I'm going to focus unapologetically on financial stewardship today uh, for three reasons. Uh, first, it's what I said I was going to do, and I think that I don't want to engage any kind of bait and switch. I want to be faithful to, to what, I, what I promised I would do. Second, Jesus talked about money more than anything else except the kingdom of God. And Jesus apparently felt no need to apologize uh, for talking directly about financial stewardship. And third, uh, financial stewardship, I think, is the hardest of those time, talent, and treasure areas. Uh, you might ask how I know that. Well, I've done a lot of teaching about money and financial stewardship. And more often than not, when I do that, someone will come up to me at some point during the day, get in my face with some measure of heat, and say, you keep talking about money, but you left out time and talent. Now, I've also talked a lot about priorities and discipleship, which is, in effect, time management. What are our values and priorities in life? I've done a lot of teaching about spiritual gifts which really is stewardship of, of, of talents. But when I've talked about time and talent, I've never yet had somebody come up to me and complain that I left out money. <laughs> and I think that's actually very revealing. I think that uh, all too often we view time, talent, and treasure as interchangeable parts and feel free to, uh, to, to offer the one you're most comfortable with at the time. Uh, I think each merits direct attention in its own right, and I'm going to focus unapologetically on, on money today. So, some biblical principles. Number one, God is the giver of all that we have. What we possess is not earned, but is a gift from God. Now, when Moses was leading the people of Israel through the wilderness on the way to the promised land, he was preparing the people for an abundance that they had never known. They've been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. They had uh, little or nothing by way of possessions. And now they're about to enter this land of abundance and be responsible for wealth that they had no preparation for. And so there's a great deal of stewardship teaching in the book of Deuteronomy as Moses helps the people prepare for that land of milk and honey uh, and how to use what the Lord will give them rightly. And so at one point, Moses anticipating them coming into the promised land says, uh, beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. There's probably no verse in scripture that more directly contradicts the messages of our culture than that one. Our culture is based on the TV commercial some of us are old enough to remember from Smith Barney. You know, I make my money the old fashioned way, I earn it. Uh, we think that what we have is ours. I earned it, I worked hard for it, I deserve it, it's mine, and I will do with it as I please. It's none of your business, uh, 
It's none of the church's business. It's probably not even any of God's business. This is mine, and I can do with it as I wish. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians, what have you that you did not receive? If you received it, why do you boast as if it were not a gift? Everything we have is a gift from God. Uh, everything that we earn ultimately goes back to gifts and abilities that are given to us by the Lord. Uh, for many years, uh, this church had uh, a relationship with the uh, mentally handicapped program in the county, and their uh, mentally handicapped crew would come in and clean the building. And some of the people on that team were, were more able than others. Some were, were very limited in what they could do and could only do one thing until a supervisor came and moved them to sweep the next spot. But we had some wonderful relationships. We would have worship services uh, together, and, and it, was a, it was a wonderful and rich relationship. And I remember walking down th the hall one day and passed a young man that I'd come to know. And as I encountered him, the Lord spoke to my heart and, and said, everything, John, that you do that you take pride in is because you were born that way. It is no credit to you. It is all the Lord's gift for you to use for God's glory. Everything we have, we have received as a gift. It all comes back to the Lord's provision. But we tend to want to keep uh, money and faith separate. We think that what we do with our money is simply a practical matter uh, that has no bearing on our, on our spiritual life because, after all, it's mine and I earned it. It has nothing to do with, with God. Some of you know your uh, medieval history uh, and may remember the, the great tribes of northern Europe uh, the Goths and the Visigoths and the Vandals and all the rest who were uh, brought into the Christian faith over the centuries. As you probably know, uh, the average Visigoth did not come to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ through a one-on-one -on -one encounter with the missionary. Uh, they came to faith because, for one reason or another, the head Visigoth became a Christian and declared his nation and army to be Christian, leaving the missionary with the somewhat awkward liturgical exercise of baptizing 10,000 Visigoths at a shot. Well, they hit upon the idea of praying a prayer of blessing over the waters of a river and ordering the army to simply march through the blessed water. Well, you can also appreciate in that context that the pre-baptismal preparation for the average Visigoth was sketchy at best. <laughs> and they seem to have a pretty rudimentary notion of baptism, that what got wet got baptized. I have friends in other traditions who think exactly the same thing, but what got wet got baptized. And so they would sometimes, in response, draw their swords and hold them high out of the water as they marched through the river with the simple notion that if they uh, kept their swords dry, they wouldn't have to make any changes in how they fought and pillaged and waged war. They could go on as before because their fighting arm was, was unbaptized. Well, in my experience, all too many American Christians have gone through the waters of baptism with wallets <laughs> held high out of the water, convinced that if we can just keep our checkbooks dry, it won't affect our lifestyle, that God uh, can have this part of my life, but I, over here, have this part of my life. So God is the giver of all that we have. Number two, we are accountable to God for what we do with what he has given to us. We are managers, not owners. Money is a spiritual matter. What we do with our money affects, for good or ill, our relationship with the Lord. The parable of the talents. You remember the, the master gives his 
his possessions to his servants and calls upon them to, uh, to manage them for him. And then, one day, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. To two of the servants, you remember he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. But to the one who was not faithful, who took what he had and hid it away, he said, you wicked and slothful servant, take the talent away from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. The biblical principle is, from the one to whom much is given, much is required. We are accountable to God for what we do with what he has entrusted to us. That means I no more own the car that I drive, or the house that I live in, or the clothes that I wear, than my banker owns what's in my checking account. My banker can use what's in my checking account, but I can demand my money at any time. I can call my banker to account for that money. And God holds us accountable for what we do with what he entrusts to us. And one day he will call us to account for how we have managed every dollar that he's put into our hands. Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 4, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. There was a television ad in this area a number of years ago from, a, uh, from an area bank that it was so outrageous. It was the ad I love to hate because it was such a, a blatant uh, promulgation of, of a worldly view and a denial of eternal truth. The ad showed a little boy being born in the delivery room. It's a very realistic delivery room scene. The mother's all hunched up and the dad's gowned up with the little hat and the doctor's there and this little boy is held up looking very much like a brand new newborn baby boy. The rest of the ad was a series of flash forwards of this little boy's life lived out under the care and protection of the bank. And so the first scene is a little boy uh, pedaling down the sidewalk on his bicycle, throwing newspapers onto front lawns. And you're thinking, ah, you know, passbook savings account, the blue banks help the boy start off right, be a good saver. And then back to the delivery room, and then you see him walking across the campus of what is obviously the college that the um, bank has helped the parents save for. Lots of IV and all the rest on the campus back to the delivery room, and then you see him with his attractive young wife standing and they're crossing the threshold of their first house, some first house, pillars and all the rest. <laughs> but the mortgage department has, has come through, back and forth to the delivery room, back and forth until finally at the end of the ad, here's this silver-haired gentleman in his uh, blazer standing with his attractive wife at the helm of this enormous yacht <laughs> sailing across the screen. And the tagline on the ad as they held up the boy is, our philosophy at such and such a bank is that even though you came into this world with nothing, you shouldn't have to leave that way. <laughs> Where I come from in Missouri, they always taught there ain't no luggage racks on hearses. <laughs> but we don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear that we are ultimately accountable to God for what we do with what he's entrusted to us. We're to use what he gives to us in light of eternity, in light of our ultimate accountability to the Lord. Number three, one aspect of being a trustworthy steward is giving. Our decisions about God are spiritual decisions. Giving brings us closer to God. We are created in God's image, and God is fundamentally a giver. And we are most like God when we give, when we trust the Lord and give of ourselves. Jesus said, Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions 
and give alms. Provide yourselves with purses that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Jesus says two basic things about money and possessions. First, he says that money can be the greatest asset we have in our relationship with God. We can actually use our money to draw closer to the Lord himself. And we see that in stories like the poor widow with her two tiny copper coins. And she offers everything she has to the Lord. And the Lord Jesus, watching, says she has shown more love for God than is shown in all of the superficial gifts of the wealthy. The story of the Good Samaritan, the one who uses his money to take the man who's been beaten by the robbers and have him fed and bandaged and cared for at the inn at his expense. And Jesus says, that's what it is to love your neighbor. Or the story of Zacchaeus, the crooked chief tax collector, which was redundant, the one who uh, is so embarrassed because of the rejection that he's experienced from everyone else. He's embarrassed to be with other people. He climbs up in the tree to get away from everybody and to see over the crowd to see Jesus. He is, Jesus speaks to him and calls him down out of the tree and says, Zacchaeus, I must come to your house today. And Zacchaeus, who's never experienced that kind of unmerited love and grace, is so overwhelmed by his experience of, of Jesus's uh, acceptance of him, that he says, uh, today I give away half of all I have. And if I've cheated anybody, one of the great biblical understatements, if I've cheated anybody, uh, he says, I repay them fourfold. And Jesus, fascinating, that doesn't sort of, if you will, tear up the check and say, I don't want your money. He says, because he knows what has gone on in Zacchaeus's heart, and how his giving reflects that transformation. Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. Amazing. But there's a flip side. Jesus also said that money can be the greatest threat to our spiritual lives. And we see it in stories like the rich young ruler, the one who's got so much money saved up, he doesn't know what else to do with it except use it to tear down his barns, to build bigger barns so he'll be safe and comfortable in his retirement. And the message to him is, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And these possessions, whose will they be? And so it is with those who are rich, but not rich toward God. What a chilling statement. And what a warning. Money can be the great threat to our relationship with God. Or the, uh, Again and again, we see the Lord issuing that, that, that invitation and that warning. But you and I have a problem with this. And that is that in our heart of hearts, we don't think this applies to us. Now, probably almost all of us can think, however, of someone else who needs to be hearing this. You know, their money and their lifestyle and unconcern for God, they have a spiritual problem. They really need to get in touch with that. But me, no. My problem's only practical, I just don't have enough of it. But Jesus makes it clear that whether we are as poor as the, as the poor widow with her two copper coins or as rich as the rich young ruler, that what we do with our money is a spiritual matter that for good or ill or affects our relationship with the Lord. How we deal with our possessions matters profoundly for our spiritual lives, our relationship with the Lord now and for eternity. Number four, as we give, we are called to tithe, to return 10% of what the Lord gives us. Well, tithing is where the rubber meets the road. This is where it gets real. Um, I can say God is the giver of all that I have. I can say, God still owns it. Everything I have belongs to the Lord. Why? Because I know, I can say God owns my car, but I've got the keys. <laughs> I mean, that could be pious lip service. 
that God, I can say, of course, I give back to God in thanksgiving for, you know, I can mouth all the words. But tithing is where it gets real. There were two farmers, Hank and Fred, and they went to the same church, and Hank said to Fred, Fred, if you had 100 cows, would you give 10 to the Lord? And Fred says, gee, I don't know, I never thought about it. Well, maybe, yeah, sure, I'd give 10 to the Lord. And he says, well, that's good. If you had 100 sheep, would you give 10 to the Lord? And he says, yeah, I'd give 10 to the Lord. And he says, well, Fred, if you had 10 pigs, would you give one to the Lord? And Fred said, that's not fair. And he says, what do you mean it's not fair? And he said, well, you know I have 10 pigs. <laughs> <laughs> well, tithing takes us away from the pious what-ifs to the reality of living as thankful stewards before the Lord. Tithing goes all the way back to Abraham. Abraham experienced such blessings that he gave back to God 10% of all that he received. And very quickly, we see the tithe becomes the standard. Leviticus 27.30 says, All the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, it is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. By the time we get to the end of the Old Testament, in the book of Malachi, failure to tithe is described as robbing God. The tithe belongs to the Lord. We might say the tithe belongs to the Lord and true giving begins above and beyond the tithe. Jesus uh, endorsed the tithe. Um, many think of the tithe simply as an Old Testament standard, but in Luke 11:42, speaking to the Pharisees about their, uh, their attitude toward their tithing, said, Woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. In other words, it's good that you're tithing, but you need also to have the right attitude of, of love toward the Lord and toward those around you in need. Don't think that because you're full of love that you don't need to follow the biblical standard. Now granted, some people will tell me that uh, they, they don't think the tithe is the only New Testament standard, and that's true. Um, Zacchaeus gave half, and the rich young ruler was asked for it all. And I often tell people if they prefer one of those other standards, that's, 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 that's fine with me. Um, the, I was not taught about, about the tithe. Um, I, I grew up in a generous uh, household. My father was very, very generous, but we didn't talk easily or openly uh, about, about money. I didn't learn about it in my um, early years in, in seminary and, and ordained ministry. I got involved in, in, in dealing with stewardship and in teaching about it the way a number of you have gotten involved in things in the church, and that is I opened my mouth once too often in a meeting and was put in charge. I was a very young priest uh, serving in the, uh, the Diocese of Virginia. For reasons known only to God, I was put on the uh, executive board of the diocese at about age 26. and the discussion was going on about uh, the, the fact that the diocese was broke, that we, um, the entire budget of the diocese had gone up about 12% in 12 years. Uh, there was, that wasn't even one year of inflation in those days, and uh, things were really in pretty desperate straits. One person suggested that what we needed to do was tell all the churches that if they gave us more money, we'd promise to send it all to the national church. I thought that lacked something as a, as a theological approach, and particularly I thought it lacked something as a, as a practical uh, approach, and proceeded to say so, probably shedding more heat than light on the matter. The problem was the person I was disagreeing with was Bishop Hall, the then Bishop of Virginia, who looked over with great condescension and uh, said he didn't say, if you're so smart, come up, but everybody heard that in the room. He then appointed me a stewardship committee of one for the Diocese of Virginia, told me to carry out a stewardship education program for 167 churches in the next 90 days, and gave me $50 with which to do it. Um, I did the only rational thing, which was panic. <laughs> um, I was advised to go see a, 
uh, a very wise uh, stewardship uh, teacher um, who then worked uh, for, the, for the wider church. Uh, and so I called him up and said, I'm who, who I am, and I'm representing the, the Diocese of Virginia, and I need your help. And I don't know how to describe his response except to say he was polite but evasive because he wasn't allowed to help unless he was formally invited. And he was smart enough to realize, who is this guy to claim that he's representing this young whippersnapper, the largest diocese in the church and all the rest. And I, he said he'd have to get back to me. And I know he called the diocesan office where I'm sure he was told, yes, we know, but he's the best we've got. Because he called back 10 minutes later and couldn't have been nicer. <laughs> and invited me to come to his office. Well, back then, a shuttle ticket in New York cost $47. So I could do that. Cab ride was on me. Went and sat down and said, uh, you know, help. And he said, well, tell me about your situation. Tell me why you're here. So I explained, well, we've got 167 churches, and we're broke, and I've got 90 days, and the clock's ticking, and I've used 47 of my $50 and all the rest. And he said, well, that sounds pretty significant. Tell me about your, uh, your stewardship. Well, we've got 167 churches, and we're broke, and we don't have this. And we don't, he said, I understand that. Tell me about your stewardship. We've got 167 churches. You know, I was wanted to talk about anything but my own stewardship. But very gently and very lovingly, he called me to deal with the claims of Christ fully in my own life because he saw me for what I was, a fearful and partially committed servant of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we talk all the time in the church about seek the giver, not the gift. And that's what he did. Because nothing that I was going to give would ever in any way make any difference to him. That wasn't his concern. He was only concerned about what he saw in me and challenged me to deal with the biblical call uh, to faithful stewardship. And so I, I understood the, the Lord was, was calling and challenging uh, my wife and me to deal with the biblical tithe. So I went back and shared that with, with Meg and we began to talk about that and pray about that. Um, I think she thought I'd lost it initially when I came back. Um, we didn't talk easily about that kind of issue about money and finances in, in our marriage because of our experiences growing up. So it wasn't easy for us initially to, to have those conversations. But uh, as, we, as we talked about it, as we prayed about it, we really heard the Lord saying, uh, I'm, I'm calling you to tithe. I'm calling you to trust me. And so we made a decision to move to the tithe. And we made a decision to do that in a couple of big steps. And we were moving ahead and experiencing real joy in that we began to look forward to going, uh, going out to dinner, sitting down in the fall, uh, and, and thinking and talking and praying about how much more can we do and how, where can we make this gift. And, and, and God began to show us a joy in giving we'd never known before. And then we got to the place where we were going to make that big step to the tithe. And it was the time when I was called, being called to be uh, the vicar of a little mission church down in Triangle. And that was a very small church with a very small budget, and a full-time priest was going to be a very big part of that very small budget. And um, I was uh, dealing with the reality of taking this position at a, at a very modest salary. My wife was seven months pregnant with our first child and going to be out of work. And we were coming to the community and hoping to buy a house, and interest rates were 18%. And though I'd made real progress, I think at that moment it was as if it all evaporated and the choice was again right before me. Will you trust the Lord? But Meg and I prayed about that, and I remember vividly the night I sat in the senior warden's living room, and he said, here's how much we can pay you. And my response was to fill out a pledge card on the spot and hand it back to him for a tithe. I do not know how the Lord does these things. All I know is that I never had a moment's sleeplessness over that mortgage. Uh, the Lord provided and more 
and brought such joy in my life. Well, as we began to, to experience that, God began to, to do a profound work in my life. For me, uh, I came to understand that money had been a log jam in my spiritual life. Now, I had a friend who worked in a logging camp in the Northwest, and he taught me a little bit about logs and log jams. And he explained that, you know, when the, they fell these enormous trees and drop them into the river, they'll float them down the river to the mill. And sometimes one of those huge logs will get in there sideways and back up the river. You know. It's not necessarily the biggest log, not necessarily the most important log or the best log, but it becomes the most important log when it's the thing that blocks everyone, everything else up. And sometimes you can't break it free without going in there and dynamiting it and blowing the, the jam loose. I think money's like that for some of us, was for me. Not necessarily the most important issue in our discipleship, but it becomes it when it's the place where we say, no, Lord. That great contradiction in terms, right? If he's Lord, the answer's yes. If it's no, he's not really Lord. But when we try to say, no, Lord, and I had to, to let the Lord blast me free. And when he did, it opened my life to the work of the Holy Spirit in ways that I had not even known to ask for. I began to teach more about this and learn more. And I remember one night I was sharing uh, with our congregation a workshop about this. And I found myself saying that which I absolutely believe, that the biblical tithe is the minimum standard for Christian giving. And as I said that in the room, as clearly as I was saying it out loud, I heard in the other ear the Lord speak to me and say, as I said, this is the biblical tithe is the minimum standard for Christian giving, then why do you treat it as if it were the maximum? And I was so undone, I had to give people some small group exercise so I could go sit over in the corner and deal with God. Because I heard the Lord really convicting me uh, about my attitude toward the tithe. I think the tithe is a milestone, not a destination. A milestone is something you take note of and mark on the way to where you're going. Um, the tithe is like going out on 95 and there's a little green sign on the side of the road that says, you know, it's mile 156. You know, you, you, you come up to it, you drive by, you don't screech on the brakes, pull off the curb, hop out of the car and say, oh, mile 156, we've arrived. It's something you note on the way by. And I had turned the tithe as a marker into a destination. And the Lord showed me that he had much more for me if I was willing to continue to trust him. And so we made a decision to continue to, to move ahead in our, in our giving. And I tell you this not because um, I'm, I'm, I'm prideful about this, quite the opposite. My giving has not always been. Uh, what it is. Uh, I was very much a, uh, a sinner and, and a rebel against, against God. But I say this because I want you to know this is real for me. Um, last year, Meg and I gave away about 30% of our income. And what we've discovered as we have given more and more to the Lord is you cannot outgive God. You cannot outgive God. He is ever faithful as we trust Him and he calls us into a deeper and deeper discipleship. And I invite you, as the Lord speaks to you and calls you, uh, to trust him more and more. Okay, number five. The motive for giving to God is thankfulness. God wants us to give with joy. There are lots of motives for giving. Uh, I remember years ago, hearing a wonderful story, uh, which I love because I travel so much and spend a lot of time on, on airplanes. In Miami, or Butte on Flagler Street, one of the main streets, there were a series of, of magnificent royal palm trees that one day, one night were vandalized. Uh, six royal palms were, were, were cut down. And the city didn't have the money to replace these very expensive trees, full-grown trees. And then one day a donor came forward and offered to replace the palm trees at private expense. 
The former palm trees were 15 feet tall, and they formed a beautiful foreground to a huge Delta Airlines billboard. The new palm trees were 35 feet tall and completely hid the billboard. The donor, Eastern Airlines. <laughs> there are lots of motives for giving, and you hear a lot of them in the church. There are false motives. The motive of pride. Jesus said the Gentiles love to be thought benefactors, and so do American Christians. Uh, I'm convinced if you can put a plaque on it, you can sell it in an American church. Um, you know, this rector given in loving memory of you know, no problem. <laughs> but that's not Jesus' way. Jesus uh, did not give greater recognition to larger gifts. He did not puff people up by uh, flattering them and telling them how generous they were. It is very tempting to play to people's pride uh, by uh, flattering them and affirming them when they are not giving uh, in accordance with biblical principles, but just giving perhaps an impressive gift in worldly terms. Uh, you can appeal to guilt. You see that in uh, magazines. You can feed this starving child or you can turn the page. Now, I believe in feeding the hungry, but the solution to guilt over our use of money is not giving. It is repentance and forgiveness, and then obedience to God's call. If we teach people that the way you deal with guilt is by writing a check, we have given them a false gospel, and we have led them away from the transforming truth of Jesus Christ. You can appeal to duty. A lot of military folks in this area, people understand duty. Um, you have an obligation to support this church. Think how much you get from this church. Uh, you have a responsibility to, uh, to support it. You see that, uh, hear that all the time on national public radio. You know, you listen to this radio program, you have an obligation to, to support it. Do you know how much it costs to educate your child in Sunday school and that kind of fee-for-service uh, approach? It's not a biblical approach. Uh, then there's the motive of give because the church is a good cause. Now that is more subtle. It's probably the most subtle uh, false motive, but that's not why we give. We don't give first because of the work of the church. We give first because of the Lord. We don't give first because the church needs it. We give first because the Lord wants it. It is our responsibility uh, to come before the Lord with a thankful heart to give. Um, I'm one of those people that thinks if the church somehow didn't need the money, we still should receive the offerings, and even if we took it out back and burned it, because we need to give. Now, once people have decided to give, then indeed it's appropriate and right to talk about what the church's mission uh, needs and how it will use those, those offerings. But first and foremost, we give uh, out, of, out of joy because it is thankfulness that is the biblical motive for our giving. Not pride or guilt or duty or good cause, but thankfulness. Uh, Psalm 116 says, What shall I render to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. If it's not based on thankfulness, it's merely fundraising. The difference between fundraising and stewardship is that fundraising has as its goal getting the money. And if you go after the money, you may or may not get it, but you won't see transformed lives as a result. If the goal is true stewardship of calling people into a deeper relationship with the Lord Jesus and a more faithful discipleship, you will see lives changed. And I believe the dollars will take care of themselves. We keep the focus on Jesus Christ. He will deal with transformed lives. The goal, the motive is thankfulness, and the way we give is, is freely. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each one must do as he has made up his own mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful 
giver. The word for cheerful there is hilarion. God loves a hilarious giver, an exuberant giver. Um, you know, Jesus gave the Pharisees a hard time. Um, you know, they were counting out uh, spices in the kitchen cabinet to make sure that they were tithing. You know, counting out dill seeds, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one for God. You know, and you know they weren't counting to, to make sure uh, they didn't give God one too few. They were counting to make sure they give, didn't give God one too many. <laughs> but a hilarious giver is a, oh, you know, give it to the Lord with joy, with thanksgiving, transforming our lives. Number six, God calls us to give so that we might experience the quality of life that he wants for us. Deuteronomy 12, 28, Moses said, Be careful to heed all these words which I command you, that it may go well with you and your children after you forever, when you do what is good and right in the sight of the Lord your God. There are two kinds of laws in the universe. Uh, the first kind of law tells you what you ought to do. Mail your Christmas packages early, drive 55 miles an hour, don't swing on 3 and 0. Oh. Things that tell you, do this in order for things to go uh, well for you in your life, because this is, uh, if not, you'll be punished, there are, there are consequences. The second kind of law doesn't tell you as much what you should do as what you will do. The law of gravity, second law of thermodynamics, these describe how life is. The law of gravity doesn't say, if you go up on the roof and jump off, please fall, and if you don't, you'll get into trouble. It tells you what will happen when you do jump off, and there are consequences. It is a natural thing for us to view God's laws as the first kind, that tell you what you should and shouldn't do. On the deepest level, God's laws are the second kind. They tell us how life really is. And if we care about our spiritual and physical well-being, we will heed God's principles. Moses is telling us that when we live life God's way, life goes better for us. Not, God's not trying to uh, spoil our fun or, or, or crimp our freedom. He's trying to help us experience what Jesus called the abundant life. And it's found in trusting him and in giving to him with an open hand. And last, number seven, after we know why we give, then we can focus on the ones who receive what we give to the Lord. Uh, Deuteronomy 15, you shall give to your poor brother freely and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him because for this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. For the poor will never cease out of the land. Therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in the land. Indeed, once we've decided to give, we, our, our stewardship calls us to be mindful of where we, where we invest that, that giving. And that's where the church's mission is so, is so important. We do need, and we'll talk more about this this afternoon, we do need to hold up the mission of the church uh, and the priority of what God is doing uh, in, in reaching the world with the good, with the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, it is important to share what the church does with its, with its work, but it's a secondary call after we have called people to give. We are not simply a voice arguing for our good cause versus all the other good causes. Uh, once we know why we give, then we can say, all right, how and where will I invest that, that giving? And the result? 2 Corinthians 9, 11 and 12, you'll be enriched in every way for great generosity, which through us will produce thanksgivings to God. For the rendering of this service not only supplies the wants of the saints, but also overflows in many thanksgivings to God. Your faithfulness, your generosity will change your life and be God's instrument in the lives of many other people who will give thanks to God for what he is doing in and through your life and your witness. I'll close with one of my, one of my favorite stories. It's about the small country church that didn't have a rector, couldn't afford one, didn't even have guest preachers very often because they couldn't afford them. But once in a while they could have a guest preacher come in and so they got a certain priest to come and handle Sunday morning services. And he arrived 
early, there was no one else there, and being a small country church, it was unlocked. So we went in and poked around and you know, read all the things on the bulletin board, read the tracks in the track rack, and uh, noticed there was a box in the back of the church, you know, one of those boxes they have for offerings for the poor. So he reached into his pocket and pulled out a couple of quarters and put them in the box. Well, sometimes later, the senior warden arrived. Senior warden came up and introduced herself, said, I'm here, we're so glad that you're here. We're delighted to have you today. It's such a privilege for us. Here's where you can vest, and here's how we do the service, and I'll leave it to you. Well, after the service, senior warden came back up and said, oh, it's just been wonderful having you here. Uh, this has just been a, a glorious day for us. And then she said, well, I'm embarrassed to say this, but we're a small country church, and we don't even have any money to pay our guest preachers. Um, but we have a system in our church. We have a box in the back where people can put offerings to give to our guest preachers. And after your Jim Dandy sermon, I know there's going to be a lot of money in that box. So she goes back with a little warden's key and opens up the box and out falls 50 cents, right? And it's all the guy could do not to laugh on the spot. Goes home, is regaling his family with this story over Sunday lunch, and they're all laughing uproariously except his 11-year-old son who looks at him and says, Dad, you don't understand. If you'd have put more in, you'd have gotten more out. <laughs> Jesus put it this way. If you seek to save your life, you lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake and the gospels, you'll find it. Or in other words, if you put more in, you get more out. The call to faithful stewardship is, a, is an invitation to enjoy the transforming power of our Lord Jesus Christ, who makes us new and uses us for his glory. Amen? Amen. Amen.